Good morning, and also a good afternoon and good evening to those joining from different time zones around the world. My name is Steve Metric, and I'm Executive Director for the Port of Seattle. We are gr very grateful that you've joined us for an update on our work to decarbonize the cruise route between Washington State, British Columbia, and Alaska. During the next 90 minutes, you'll hear directly from those involved in our Green Corridor Initiative and supporting us with global context. First, a little background. We began this work in earnest last May when 14 different organizations announced the intention to explore what would be the world's first cruise-led green corridor under the Clyde Bank Declaration. I wanna start by acknowledging this group of first movers. In Alaska, the city and borough of Juneau, city and borough of Sitka, Hainesboro, and the municipality of Skagway. In British Columbia, the Greater Victoria Harbor Authority and the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority. Our cruise line partners with Carnival Corporation, Norwegian Cruise Line Holdings, Royal Caribbean Group and their cruise line brands, as well as the Cruise Lines International Association, CLIA. And our NGO partners, Global Maritime Forum, Blue Sky Maritime Coalition, and Mar Washington Maritime Blue. And of course, the Port of Seattle. This is a remarkably diverse group of organizations from multinational corporations to towns that sometimes have fewer than 1,200 residents. While we are diverse, we share a common mission to expand economic opportunity while reducing environmental impact. I personally believe that glo the global decarbonization of industry while supporting economic opportunity is the challenge of our time. And it is a growing fo focus of our work here at the Port of Seattle. To meet this challenge, we must all work together. None of us have the abilities, knowledge, resources, authority, or influence to make industry-wide change independently. We need to collaborate and work together on the strategies and approaches that will transition us to a clean energy economy. The value of partnership is just not true of our first movers partners, but also true for everyone joining this webinar. We have folks here today from the United States and Canadian governments, state and local governments, other private sector companies, and NGOs who are working to decarbonize crews and other maritime industries. Five years ago, we were discussing decarbonization as the goal, but the road ahead was very cloudy. And now we're starting to see more clarity in the terms of clean energy options and the related value chain more than ever before. It's an exciting time. We will need the partnership of everyone here to invest resources wisely, ensure safety, and expand opportunity as we phase out fossil fuels. Thank you for your work and for making our Green Corridor one of your priorities. Now, I'm going to turn this over to our moderator, Vesa Koivuma, the head of growth for Wartzilla and a founding member of the Blue Sky Maritime Coalition to get us going. Vesa. Thank you, Steve. My name is Vesa Koivuma. I will and I will moderate this 90 minute webinar today. Just a bit about me. I am a head of growth for Wartzilla where we use technologies and services to improve environmental and business performance. We are also one of the founding members of the Maritime Blue Sky Coalition, which is dedicated to decarbonizing the maritime transportation value chain and is one of the first movers for this Green Corridor. Today, we have three brief uh, panels to update you on the progress of this Pacific Northwest to Alaska Green Corridor effort and how it fits in the broader work happening <clears throat> to decarbonize maritime. We also have a one brief segment we are calling a port spotlight to update you on the current decarbonization efforts at the Port of Seattle. We will take audience questions during each panel. Just go ahead and submit your questions as uh, speakers go along. The, this webinar is recorded and will be available as soon as possible from the port of, port's website. I think it would be helpful also clarify some of the definitions that uh, as we get started today. A green corridor is a shipping route where the zero greenhouse gas solutions are considered, demonstrated and supported. The concept of a green corridor really took off in, uh, in 2021. Uh, during the COP26, when the 24 countries, including the United States and the Canada, si uh, signed the Clyde Bank Declaration and committed to support the establishment of at least six corridors by 2025. You, what you, you will hear today is that there are some playbooks, 
no no one size fits all uh, solutions to achieve the green corridor. While we can learn from each other, collaborate, the conditions in every uh, corridor require customized uh, approaches. So with that, let's uh, learn about uh, the latest with the Pacific Northwest to Alaska Green Corridor. I would like to introduce the members of our first panel. Robert Morgan Stern, Holland America, Group Senior Vice President, Alaska Operations. Alex Pierce, City of Borough of Juneau Tourism Manager. Stephanie jones Stephens, Port of Seattle Maritime Divisions Managing Director. And Christine Rigby, Vancouver Fraser, uh, Fraser Port Authority Climate Action and Air Quality Manager. So Stephanie, the first movers announced this effort last May at the International Association uh, Ports and Harbors mm -hmm. Annual Meeting in Vancouver. What was going on behind the scenes to bring something like this together? Uh, thank you, Vesa. That's a great question. As you can imagine, there was a, a lot going on in the background. We don't, to bring 14 different uh, uh, parties together with really different organizations and launch a green corridor it just doesn't happen overnight, especially when we've got multiple states and countries involved. Uh, so something we really needed to build uh, build towards, and I'm gonna, I, really for me, the foundation was uh, based on a couple things. Years ago, uh, we uh, created the Northwest Ports Clean Air Strategy with uh, Port of Seattle, Port of Tacoma, and the uh, Port of Vancouver uh, in in uh, in uh, Vancouver, BC. And that focus really uh, was on you know putting aside our our natural competitiveness as ports and looking beyond how we can all uh, bring clean air to our region. That really set the foundation for regional collaboration between ports in terms of thinking um, thinking collectively about our region and air quality. The second thing that was really important is actually uh, the COVID pandemic when. Um, when cruise, uh, the cruise industry was shut down and we were beginning to come back, really was important for us to be collaborating between ports and talking about how are we gonna approach uh, restarting the industry? How are we gonna approach COVID protocols? How are we thinking about this collectively in a way that could work? So it really increased the amount of collaboration between ports uh, along this route. Uh, you know, and then the conversation naturally flowed to other uh, cruise priorities, um, and uh, all of us are focused on sustainability and decarbonization, and we had begun to think we really have an opportunity here to uh, uh, do some great things in this, in this region, and when the Clyde Bank Declaration uh, came out of COP26, as you referred to earlier, naming green corridors as a priority strategy, we really saw that Washington, British Columbia, and Alaska route had the right vision, the right players, and the right partners to really think holistically about decarbonization. If we hadn't had that foundation of the Northwest Ports Clean Air Strategy, uh, and of course the relationships we, we deepened during COVID, it would have been a lot harder to get this off the ground. So uh, I really think that collaboration is the foundation of, of all the progress that we're making. Um, so uh, growing from there, we were able to pull the parties uh, all together and announce the Green Corridor at IAPH in May. Excellent. Uh, next one is uh, Robert for you. Most of the first movers already have, a, uh, have climate commitments and carbon reduction efforts. What appealed to you about specifically uh, exploring the uh, Green Corridor? Uh, thanks, Vesa. I you're right. Uh, we we have very ambitious goals set, the industry and, and each of the lines. Um, those goals and targets are aligned often with um, the IMO and other regulatory targets as well around the world. So this is certainly a global issue and a ship an, an issue for all shipping. What what was intriguing about the Green Corridor was an opportunity for creating the right environment for stakeholders, kind of a to get to a coalition of the willing um, and get all the stakeholders together working in the same direction. 
Um, it would also be a way to bring scale to the challenge of whether it be new fuels or things like shore power, um, getting all the, the operators in the different parts of the value chain together, um, whether it be you know, technical or regulatory or whomever. And um, so to us, it seemed like a, a, a novel way to bring all the stakeholders together in, in alignment. Excellent. Um, then the question for all the representatives from the boards. So uh, this uh, first mover group includes global companies and remote towns of 1,200 people, even less during the winters. Uh, what is unique? Uh, what unique contributions do ports bring to the first movers group? And Alex, I'll start with you. Thanks, Vesa. And um, I can speak more specifically for the Alaska ports. As you said in the introduction, there's no one size fits all approach for green corridors, and there's also no one size fits all approach for ports. Up here, we have ports of various sizes and various levels of development and a very different political and regulatory environment with different pressures than Vancouver or Seattle. So for the smaller ports, I think we provide that scalability that's relevant to elsewhere in the world where cruise ships operate and also provide some perspective on our region and what the needs of individual ports of call right might be. And a good example of that is shore power. We're pursuing shore power actively in Juneau. We were the first port in the world to have shore power here in Juneau. I believe Seattle was second. And some other smaller ports, that might not be an option and it might not make sense environmentally. The whole town may run on diesel. So I think as we're considering what decarbonization means, we need to consider scalability for size of different ports and then be able to apply that elsewhere in the world where there may be similar challenges. And um, I think that's really what this is all about is providing a creating a feasibility study that can be applied elsewhere. Thanks, Alex. And let's migrate then to Vancouver and Christine. Sure, thanks, Vesa. Um, I think that ports really bring together knowledge across multiple sectors. Um, we're, we're not just trying to decarbonize the cruise industry, we're trying to decarbonize everything that happens at ports, both on the land side and the water side. So it's really a matter of, of taking all of those stakeholders and, and, and what it is that they're trying to do, where they're trying to do it, when they're trying to do it, and how they're trying to do it, and, make, and, and making sense of that. Um, and this is really particularly relevant, I think, for this green corridor, given the seasonal nature of the cruise industry. Um, in order to ensure that there's sufficient demand for the fuel or the infrastructure, economies of scale for that, then we need to be looking at both cruise as well as other sectors. And so ports, I think, are in a good position to bring all of that information together and, and, and help with the master planning. Thank you. Thanks, Christine and Stephanie. Yeah, thanks. So just building on what both Alex and uh, Christine said, I, I really see ports as a as a connector. And uh, this uh, port of Seattle, in this case, is a home port. So uh, uh, we're like the home base. Ships leave and come back. And so the infrastructure that we can provide here, both in terms of, of fueling, shore power, et cetera, is, is, uh, is really important. Uh, so uh, you're going to hear a lot more. I'm actually going to give a little bit of a teaser for David's presentation later because you'll hear a lot about some of the things that we're we're doing. And then, of course, uh, as a public port authority, we really are a connection between what's going on in our communities and and the businesses that we're running. And I think the port plays an important role there as well. Thanks, Stephanie. Coming back to Alex and, and Christine, the next one. What has the group been working on and what are the immediate next steps? Uh, Alex, if you start. Sure, thank you. Well, we're a very large and diverse group, um, as you could see with all the logos up on the initial slides. And we spent, as Stephanie alluded to in her intro, a lot of time before signing the first mover commitment, talking about scope and methodology and what's part of the project and what isn't. It was important to just focus on the fuel pathway for this green corridor effort. That's what defines a green corridor. But we recognize that there are a number of other 
decarbonization initiatives that need to take place in all our ports. And while we wanted to keep the scope of this project tight and not expand to things like shore excursions and buses and other port infrastructure in the home ports, it's still important that we're collaborating. And I think with this first movers group, we've really grown to learn a lot about each other's operations, each other's ports and each other's environments. And uh, while everybody's talked about collaboration, it really is the key to success as a region. We signed the first movers commitment last spring. We signed the project charter defining the scope and governance structure in early March. And we're moving into a feasibility study, which I'll let Christine talk about. All right, Christine. Thanks, Alex. Um, so when Stephanie was speaking earlier, she mentioned the Northwest Ports Clean Air Strategy. Um, so that was at the time when it was developed, uh, three ports coming together, just three and just ports coming together to work on uh, reducing air emissions in, in a shared airshed. Here we have uh, ports, shipping lines, NGOs, all kinds of different uh, members, part of our first movers group, and far more than just three. Um, so we've really spent a lot of time, a very important time, uh, working to develop our relationships. How are we going to do this together? Where are we each at in our journey towards decarbonization, which is very different for each of each of the, the partners in this initiative. And it's important to, to understand that and get to know each other before we move forward with it. Um, Alex also mentioned our first deliverable. Um, so we've been doing some really critical thinking about what this first joint deliverable is going to be through this initiative, and, and that's a landscape assessment. And the landscape assessment is really intended to look at the technological, economic, and regulatory or policy conditions that currently exist today in this region that would help to support the development of a green corridor, but also where there might be gaps uh, in those areas and, and potential risks or even opportunities and how we could address those through this green corridor. Thank you. Uh, so, Christine, a little bit. Of, let's go to the next question. So, a nice follow up on this is how is the first mover group influencing the carbon reduction plans uh, you were already uh, working on? Yeah, I, I would say that the, the Green Quarter effort is very complementary to the work that we're doing in the Port of Vancouver. And, and I imagine for all of the other uh, partners within, within this, with this effort. Specifically in Vancouver, you know, we have uh, our Eco Action Vessel Incentive Program that we've had since 2007. We now offer 75%, up to 75% off of fees for vessels that call our port if they connect to shore power, if they use alternative fuels, technologies, anything that really reduces air emissions that contribute to either air quality or climate change, as well as underwater noise. Um, we actually provide about $2 million worth of incentives every year through that program. So it's it's one of our one of our biggest initiatives. Um, I think Alex mentioned shore power earlier. I think we've got one, two, and three for that. I think we were third in the world to have shore power. We've had it since 2009 at our at our cruise terminal here in Vancouver. Um, we've reduced more than 30,000 metric tons of greenhouse gases since we implemented uh, that that program. And so it's been really fantastic. Every year we have more and more cruise ships looking to connect, and and it's really it's really one of our best ways that we have found so far, not just to decarbonize, but also to reduce air quality impacts uh, on near port communities. Um, and maybe lastly, I'll just mention testing and adoption of low and zero emission fuels. I think that that's something that we're going to be looking at through this green corridor, the potential for us to do that here. And we have our low emission technology initiative that's a partnership with the province of British Columbia, where we've been testing things like uh, biodiesel, battery electric, um, hydrogen and, and all sorts of different fuels and technologies as well. So again, I think all of the all of the partners in the first movers are are trying different things, and I think coming together through this green corridor effort will be very complementary and help us to collectively move that forward. Thank you. Thanks, Christine and Robert. Before I ask you the last question, um, just want to let the audience know is that this is a great time to start submitting uh, uh, questions for this panel, and so the. The way we approach is this, that at the end of each panel, we have a Q&A. So this is an opportunity to ask this uh, group of experts and, and first movers questions you have. So the last question. This is an only cruise focused uh, green corridor exploring efforts in the world. But increasingly, in, oh, sorry, but interestingly, it's only part, partial year season 
with the less than 10% of world's passenger volume. Why is the Pacific Northwest to Alaska corridor the right place to start? And Robert, that's for you. Sure. So this was a discussion at, at the formation stage that we had an awful lot. Um, and uh, in some, some regards was raised as a, as a challenge, but when you look at the design approach of green corridors, one of the fundamental premises is to focus on specific routes and specific sectors as an advantage because it it helps to link and sort of narrow the scope of vessel types and routes and port falls and and therefore you know to commit to specific fuels and technologies. And in other words, the problem size can become more manageable and not as overwhelming as trying to solve across the globe, for example. Um, seasonality is a challenge, but the reality is in cruise shipping is you know, our assets are movable and uh, most of our trades where we operate are seasonal. And so uh, this is something we have to really solve everywhere. And I think the feasibility study that was referred to earlier will be helpful at driving at this exact issue in terms of you know what are the conditions needed to be to be successful. And so we have to crack that challenge everywhere. And um, more specifically about the region, you know, as Stephanie and Christine outlined, uh, the Pacific Northwest makes a lot of sense. It's got a bold point of view, a bold leadership position on climate topics. It's got the history of the clean air strategy behind it. Um, and, you know, it's a region that is very rich in um, technology, the technology hub, some of the NGO partners that are part of this are, you know, amongst the world leaders. And so I think regionally, it's very well uh, positioned to, you know, really take the, or to, to be a focused green corridor. Uh, and again, the only cruise one in at, at this stage in the world. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and now to the, the Q&A part from the audience. And uh, the first question comes from Yai Mahtani, City Council of uh, Ketchikan. Uh, how can a cruise line partners help a, achieve costs for getting a shore power at our port, uh, ports? Small communities cannot alone afford, uh, uh, the example over here being the, 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 the city of Ketchikan. Um, anybody wants to take that one? I'll, uh, I'll take a crack at it. This, uh, right. um, so, yeah, so the question is really, um, it, with, with regard to shore power, it can be quite costly for a municipality uh, or a port, depending on you know, how, a, how a community is structured to implement uh, that technology. There's obviously a, quite a bit of feasibility work has to be done on whether or not the power exists and if that power source is clean power. And then uh, typically a lot of the cost is around connecting from the power grid to the actual port where the ships uh, bird. And, um, and so that varies quite a bit by community in a place like Ketchikan or um, you know, Victoria is looking at the same issue right now. I think Green Corridor can be actually quite a big help because what, what is really useful in terms of going after things like federal funding support through the infrastructure funds that are available as an example, is a coordinated and regional strategy. Uh, virtually every um, program that is out there requires some kind of strategic background in order to be eligible even for, for grant money. So one of the things we've been working on as an industry is trying to figure out how do we leverage this, this green corridor effort, for example, to develop a coordinated regional strategy that would help with regulatory community, with government, NGOs, et cetera, but to try to galvanize resources for communities that may on their own not be able to, uh, to get there. Thanks, Robert. And um, maybe we have one more, uh, well, we're running out of time and, and, and limited time on the webinar. We have great questions about a little bit asking more about the landscape assessment, when it will start and so forth. Uh, for the audience, we collect all these answers and uh, we are doing our uh, best of uh, providing answers uh, on, the, on the port website. Uh, there's also, Alex, I think for you, is there's about energy options in Alaska and so forth. 
Um, nevertheless, unfortunately, we run out of time. I think there's quite a lot that we could discuss and much longer, but I thank the panel and uh, we shall move to the next panel. So moving along. Um, so uh, to our discussion, keep an eye on, on what's happening with Alaska Pacific Northwest uh, Green Corridor, but also starting to put these these decarbonization efforts into a broader industry-wide context. Uh, I would like to welcome our next set of panelists, Bill Burke, Carnival Corporation, Chief Maritime, Maritime Officer, Nick Rose, Royal Caribbean Vice President of Environmental Social Governance, Jessica John, Norwegian uh, Cruise Line Holdings, Vice President of Environmental Social Governance, Investor Relations, and Corporate Communications. Welcome. Um, and the way I have this, uh, uh, basically the way the questions are is that they are all, all three of you panelists over here. So um, let's see. And uh, let's start with the first question. And, and first one, uh, uh, Bill, I will start with you. Uh, the question is, this is a competitive industry, but here you are collaborating on the Green Corridor. Tell us about why was it important for you to join this effort? Um, well, I, th I think the answer to the question is sustainability is not just a concept for us, but it's integrated into our business. And we know we are better off together with a louder voice, but also learning from one another. For example, in 2018, we worked as an industry under CLIA, the cruise line um, association to get the entire cruise industry aligned to the IMO goals. We wanted to be an early adopter and lead the way in the shipping industry. And we're used to working together because our seat at the IMO table is through CLIA. And we worked as an industry group to identify a better intensity metric to avoid the current perverse incentive in the carbon intensity indicator. Those are just a couple of examples of how we've worked together in the past. So it's not unusual that we would be working together um, in this endeavor. All right. Uh, Nick, uh, same question. Any comments on your side? Sure. Yeah. I mean, so they, just to add on to what uh, Bill was, was talking about, and I think Steve mentioned it first, is I think very clearly solving this challenge no one can do alone. And I think coordinating with multiple members at, at multiple different levels within the cruise industry from ports to NGOs, to um, some of our actual competitors will help us kind of learn what some are doing, what are not doing, what works, what doesn't work. But I think the more the, or the more collective approach also can help us with one voice share with other governmental entities and, and, and other stakeholders of what is actually needed. Because I think one thing that, you know, as we go along this journey, um, you know, is that we're going to find out that, that there are going to be needs of things that are outside cruises value chain, right? There's gonna be things that are gonna to have to come a part of this that is outside the, the, the core value chain of, of cruising and doing it through one group and through one coalition will kind of allow us to have that one voice speaking outwards. And also too, I think what makes it important in this area, I'll just kind of harp on that one a little bit, was the fact that, you know, if you look, we've always in this area have always kind of done it through a regional approach, whether it was this green quarter or whether what this region did in order to, to get cruising back after the long suspension during the COVID-19 outbreak. So it shows that this group is also willing to work together collaboratively, which is also another reason why we want to be a part of it. All right, thanks Nick and uh, Jessica. Uh, yeah, sure. So I think when we think about Norwegian Cruise Line Holdings and our commitment, um, our commitment to pursue net zero emissions by 2050 is across all three scopes. So all of our greenhouse gas emissions across all three scopes. So by definition, it's not something we can tackle alone. It's not just our ship operations or our fuel consumption. It's our business travel, it's our waste, it's our supply chain, um, and it's our, our terminal at Pier 66. So when we look at this, we, we don't think there's any way for us to address our entire footprint without having coordination and without working together not just with our competitors, but also a wide network of other stakeholders, whether it's the fuel producers, the suppliers, the communities that we visit. Um, it, it's really gonna take a village to be able to get to, to the ultimate goal that we all want of, of net zero. Um, when you think about green corridors specifically, 
um, we think it creates the space for, for organizations and communities that are all aligned on that same vision and, and goal um, to come together and identify and execute the opportunities, right? And, and having us work together allows for us to get that early and rapid adoption of fuels, right? Rather than one of us trying to tackle one thing at one time, we can have much more of an impact um, if we join together. And then I think Nick alluded to this too, like when you think about climate change, it's a big global issue, right? It's going to have research and development and deployment at a massive scale, but decarbonization can be done on a much more local basis. Um, so what works for one region is not going to work for another. And, and so you really do have to have that tailored, um, more local approach there. And, and when you think about this region in particular, we heard from the last panel, um, these are first movers in, in terms of decarbonization and some of these efforts overall. Um, so it really made sense to, to start here. And we're really excited about continuing that collaboration. And we want to make sure that as we're charting a pathway for decarb um, for our company and our industry, that we're also doing it, that we can help support this region's broader goals, right? Economic, social, environmental. Um, so we think that there's much more opportunity working together than there is on an individual basis. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, next question for all, all, all three of you again, uh, but let me start with Nick, with you. What do you see are the, uh, what do you see as a, some of the long and short-term steps toward the zero carbon fuels? Sure, well, thank you. So, I mean, I, I think first, when you start looking at what is the, you know, what steps need to be taken? I think the first step is the step that was taken to form this actual group. Understand what are, what are your limitations as, as an individual organization and how can you partner and look at other ways of actually tackling this global problem, right, of, of looking at carbon. Um, I think when you look at what are the next steps, I think, you know, as Royal, we look at it two different ways. One is what is what is the steps you need to take for future ships and for future growth of the industry, but also not, you know, not looking or not forgetting the fact that, you know, there are ships operating today that have technological limitations that maybe new ships won't have, right? Because there's new technology being delivered every single day and in in, in looking forward. And, you know, when you, when you look at it that way, you need to understand that in the very short term, medium term, some of those steps taken may not be the ultimate drastic term. They will be looking at things that help you transition to the ultimate um, let's say the ultimate power source, the ultimate fuel source or whatever comes down the way, whether it's hydrogen, whether it's, whether it's other types of fuels such as methanols, ethanols, you know, any of the biodiesels, anything like that. I think when you look at those short-term steps, you might have to take multiples of them. Um, when you look at long-term things, I think you can start to look at what is going to be that end actual goal. What, what, does, that, what does that end future look like? And when you look at it from, from, from a cruise industry, when you start looking at how cruise industry look, build ships and actually acquire ships and you look further out, you'll realize that nothing happens overnight. So decisions you make today might ultimately, you know, look towards that actual future. And you may not see it for some time because it takes time to develop the actual technology, to develop the ability to, to, to not only make the technology, but make it work within a certain region. Because as I said in my first one, when you look at the value chain, right, when you look at all these fuels, whether it's a, whether it's a methanol, whether it's a hydrogen, whether it's a, a, an actual biodiesel or some other type of drop in types of fuels, um, it's not just us being there as, as an actual consumer. But we need to work with the whole value chain of suppliers, uh, fuel manufacturers, engine manufacturers, technological manufacturers, in order to make sure that when, when, when we are making these actual commitments, we understand the impacts along the value chain and making sure that when we do decide what steps need to be taken that we are taking all those into, into account. So I think when you look at short, long and medium term, we're looking at all the different resources that we can actually use and knowing that we're probably gonna use a, a very large portfolio approach of them, knowing that there's not one silver bullet today. Um, so that in order to go down that path, we need to look at all the different bullets. Excellent, yeah, it is a quite a mixed landscape. Uh, uh, Jessica. Uh, yeah. Your side. yeah, I, I think one of the, the most important first steps is, is getting a little bit more standardization and, and strengthening of what those commitments actually are on, on a global, local and regional level. Right. So understanding what we're all working towards. And I think that'll help um, companies and, and ports and, and different regions um, be able to really chart a, a proper pathway because they're they know what the end goal is. 
Um, and I think from there, it goes back to that short and, and medium and long term, like the solutions are not going to exist today in the long term, but we need to start mobilizing the demand to, to first find those short term fuel solutions. So Nick touched on it a little bit, biodiesel is one of them. Um, that one's a great option for cruise lines, right? Because we do have existing ships. We have ships that have been in service for you know, 30 years that it would require a significant amount of investment to, to change today. Um, but something like biodiesel allows us to um, blend it with traditional fossil fuels, and then you can use it as a drop-in solution. Um, it's not something that's that easy, right? And, and it is something that um, is going to have some limited availability. So over the longer term, you're going to have competition for things like biodiesel from aviation, from road transportation. So we don't necessarily view it as a large-scale um, long-term solution, but it's something that can help us now. So we can start making some impact today. Longer term, um, I think, you know, quite frankly, the maritime industry at large has not converged on what that, that specific fuel set is going to be that they're looking at. I think you have seen some convergence. You know, you see methanol and hydrogen kind of emerge as LNG in the, in the near term, but methanol, methanol and hydrogen kind of emerge as some of the longer term solutions. Um, but we haven't really rallied around two or three sources of fuel the way that you've kind of seen something like aviation do. Um, and when we talk to fuel producers, what we hear all the time is not that they're not willing to invest, but they need to know that there is demand, right, before they know what where to head in terms of their investment. And then when you talk to the customers, they say the same thing. Well, we can't make a decision because we need to know where the fuel supply is going to be for us to make a commitment. Um, so it, it really is becomes a cycle where until you have the first movers who take that bold initial step, um, you really get into this, um, you know, everyone waiting on each other to make that first move. So for our part, we have been collaborating with um, other maritime companies, with class societies, um, with our shipyards, our engine manufacturers, in order to try to try to move forward and, and start taking those initial steps. Um, and we think once you start doing that, you can't keep it to yourself, right? A, a company just talking about it within their own team isn't going to help that larger problem. Um, so we want to make sure that you're signaling to the market what your what long-term options are needed and when. Um, so for us, we have leaned in very um, heavily into methanol as, as one of the exciting options that we look at in the future. So we have actually announced that um, two of our new build ships in 2027 and 2028 are going to be modified to be able to accommodate both diesel and green methanol. Um, and we're also ex we're also retrofitting some existing ships, um, just testing testing the use of methanol by 2025. So we think that the more that we can do that and we can go out there and, and make these public statements, then it signals to the suppliers that there is demand for these fuels um, if they're able to provide it for us in the long term. Thanks, Jessica. And Bill? Well, I think I'm, <clears throat> I'm pretty well aligned with the others, but uh, I do see this as a two-pronged process and there's no discussion about the uh, steps towards zero carbon fuels that is complete without addressing our efforts toward efficiency because this is what we can do now and have a real impact. Not only that, but it also reduces the amount of these future fuels that we will, we will need. Uh, specifically in the short term, I think um, as was described, I, th I think we need to narrow the focus on which fuels make sense. And there are a number of considerations, whether it's availability. <clears throat> availability in the green format is, is also pretty mm -hmm. important. There's not much of that out there today. Um, handling concerns, volume concerns, and then, and then you need to either convert and pilot or, or build. And then uh, in the longer term, as was mentioned, we need a demand signal for the fuels. And, uh, and, and, and as you know, we have a strong demand signal for, for LNG. And, uh, and then we have to uh, design and build the ships. Um, to use these new fuels. And once again, I hate to say it a second time, but we need, we need green production of these fuels. You know, the, the fuels themselves are usable, but the volumes are not available yet in, in, in the green format. And we need to have that in, um, developed. Now, <clears throat> what are we doing specifically? We peaked our carbon in 2011 while increasing capacity by 30% since. Uh, we've, we've significantly changed our fleet composition. We've eliminated 26 older, less efficient ships in the last couple of years, while bringing in 15 new 
more efficient ships. Um, prior to the pandemic, we spent several hundred million dollars on efficiency enhancements. Um, we've got additional funding in place from last year through the next couple of years to, to for what we call our service power package, which is HVAC upgrades, variable frequency drives, LED lighting for the ships that don't yet have it, uh, instrumentation so we can measure additional shore power connections. Um, <clears throat> and then when you look at fuel, we pioneered the LNG. We've got eight ships now and three more on order. We've tested two ships on biofuel. One was a blend and the other is 100% bio, which is far better than it was when I was testing this uh, 10 years ago when I was in the Navy. And then um, we're working with our engine manufacturers to convert a couple ships to uh, a couple engines on a couple ships to methanol. We're testing a big battery, which allows for peak shaving and zero emission cruising. And we're testing fuel cells. So like the others, we have a lot of irons in the fire and, and we haven't settled on, on the solution yet, but we're working to, uh, to figure out where the, the solutions are. And I think, I think the solution will be solutions, not, not singular. Thank you, Bill. So you basically already answered my sort of follow-up questions. What are some of the steps you're already taking to reduce the fossil fuels or lower your carbon intensity? So uh, maybe uh, Nick, if, if any uh, on your side, do you wanna, on the rail side? Sure, yeah, I mean, like just to follow kind of, you know, we've, we've all taken similar passes. Um, obviously for Royal Caribbean, you know, we've, we believe as, as Bill mentioned that the, the best way to reduce emissions is to not have emissions at all. And what that means is, by that point is burning, you know, or consuming the less amount of whatever the fuel is, is the number one option. So for us, it's about making sure that we have the most energy efficient ship possible, right? We've, we've, we've reduced our emissions um, uh, by 35% since 2008. We now have a, another goal set to, uh, to reduce it by another double digits by 2025 from a 2019 baseline. And we will continue the actual journey as we go down towards our ultimate vision goal of getting to be net zero by 2050. Um, Additionally to that, obviously we have in, we have invested in, in technology on some of our new builds coming out. Um, some of those being uh, a new type of fuel, such as LNG. Um, we also have um, committed more recently. I think it was announced a week ago or two weeks ago um, uh, of pioneering and delivering a ship um, capable uh, with a trial fuel engine that, that can also consume methanol with all of the with all the storage capacity as well with the ship coming that way. We've also trialed 100% uh, biodiesel on our on 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 ships um, that allowed us to really you know really trial the, it to a 100% because there are technological challenges that we had to make sure that we were we were overcoming and making sure that you know we, we were not having some of those issues. So for for us, that's kind of what Royal has done over over this time. And there's many more of these initiatives that are happening with every ship that is being delivered. And making sure that every ship is more efficient than, it, than than its previous ship, and what I guess excites us most about this journey is is while those have been done all at scale, we think you know through this green quarter process we can look at maybe to take that scale a little bit further north, right? Of expanding it just a, a little bit more because that is going to be the ultimate challenge for any one of us, whether it's shipping, airlines, um, or any any local port or or community is. How can you do this at scale and what does that time frame look like? So we're excited. Thanks, Nick. And Jessica. Yeah, um, I, we talked a little bit about our strategy on the alternative fuel side with what we're doing with the methanol ships and, and biodiesel. Um, I think I'm, I'm very well aligned with Bill and Nick in, in terms of actually um, energy efficiency program improvements on your existing ships, right? It's the same thing that we, we're all trying to do, reduce the emissions on our existing footprint. Um, it's not only going to help on the emissions front, it helps on the fuel savings front. So it's good business, right? And, and, and it's not just about um, one factor here. Um, so we've actually, we're, we do this every day, right? This is a, a, a series of projects that our technical operations teams are always working on. We have been able to reduce our emissions intensity by about 14% pre-pandemic between 2015 and 2019. And so they'll continue to chip away at it. It's, it's all the projects that Bill talked about. It's HVAC upgrades, it's LED lighting, um, it's, you know, hydrodynamic upgrades. It's, it's across the board, a lot of these little things that add up to have a much bigger impact. And that's, that's certainly a, a pillar and, and one of the actually prongs of our climate action strategy, because we know, look, 
until until we get to that alternative fuel. Um, and even then, we still want to reduce the the overall emissions, and we want to be as efficient as possible, both from a decarbonization perspective and from a business one as well. Thanks, Jessica. And it's great for the great audience to know. We know among the industry what have we done during the before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and then past. But it's great to also them to have this exposure on that. So, last question before we go to the, uh, uh, the question from the audience, I'll Jessica I'll continue with you. What are some of the external factors you are considering as you make long uh, long term plans for decarbonization? Examples like production, supply, regulatory readiness, financial tools, uh, tools, uh, anything else? Yeah. Yeah, I think there's there's probably as many external factors as there are internal factors at this point for for decarbonization. Um, the two that would kind of come to my mind right away is obviously advancements in ship technology. Um, so when you think about a ship, it's usually a 30 year plus type of uh, life asset. Um, so the ships that we create now and the ships that we put into service now are likely still going to be here in 2050, right? When we think about getting to a net zero. Um, and the way that cruise ships are designed, it's not the same as a cargo ship, for example. Design decisions are made very early on in the process. So even our ships that are delivered now probably were signed back in 2015, 2016. Um, and there, there is a little bit less um, you know, leeway for us to be able to move them, move them around to accommodate new technologies once we have that, once we catch up in terms of uh, new fuels or new technologies. So that's one consideration. We're always looking at what technology is available and how can we make sure that our ships are the most flexible and have the most optionality to accommodate technologies that don't exist yet because we are thinking so far ahead in the future. Um, the other thing I would point to is, is the cost and competition for renewable energy sources. So this is something that my team had brought to me at one point that has kind of stuck with me that you know the research that the Global Maritime Forum had done was over 85% of the funds that are needed to decarbonize the maritime sector are actually based in the land-based infrastructure side. So not the technology on our ships, but the land-based portion of it and how we support that. Uh, so the production of e-fuels alone, right? It, that's gonna require a massive increase and massive installations of additional renewable energy production capacity. So that, that investment, it's not just gonna be for maritime, right? It's gonna be required from other sectors as well. Um, industrial production, road transportation. And so we already run into these issues. Shore power, I think, is a really good example. Um, port Miami, if you take a, another port here, uh, seven ships can be in that port at the same time, but only three ships can plug in at that one time, right? So even if we all go in there with shore power capable ships, we can't all plug in because there's not enough power in the grid to support that many ships at that port. So it's not going to be just a matter of us having the capability, but we need to be able to have the investments on the, the land side um, to support the, the grid capacity that we would need for all of us to be able to, to plug in each one of our ships at the same time. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, Bill? I think there are just so many things that matter as, as Jessica mentioned. Um, production is important today, but it's, but, uh, you know, that these fuels are available, but they have to be available in a green way supply. Um, we, we have some, and I'm and the others will have experience with this as well, but LNG has been around for 50 years and there's still no robust, robust supply chain for it. So we, we've had to tailor the supply chain to our itineraries. Um, regulatory support is, is a, a big consideration. It'd be great if regulators got ahead of the curve and we knew what the rules were rather than us be ahead of them and then the rules come in later on. And that, that makes it harder because as Jessica mentioned, these ships are, are long-term assets. Um, financial support, uh, financial tools to, to allow these fuels will be critical to overcome the initial cost challenges of production as well as uh, uh, support to R&D. Um, ensuring enough renewable energy is available to produce these uh, fuels is extremely important. And that's, that's a big one on the, on the shore side, um, similar to uh, shore power as mentioned. Um, and then there's, there's other things like safety of handling um, and use. Um, ammonia is a, tough, is a tough fuel for us to use in a, in a crude engine room 
you know, it's, it's toxic. So it doesn't seem like that's in our future. Um, volume that these fuels would use is important when you, when you think about it, when you look at hydrogen, it's probably even with, even cooled, it's three times the volume of the, of the current fuel. So it's, it's probably a challenge for us to use because of the, the lack of, uh, lack of space. And then just ease of use is another thing that I think we have to look at. We, you know, we have crews that come from all over the world and getting them trained to use these new fuels is, uh, is a critical po- uh, piece for us. And we have to, we have to make sure we get that right. So um, those are just a couple of things I think we have to consider. Thanks, Bill. And Nick? Sure. I mean, so just to follow up with what Bill and Jessica said, I agree with that. I said, and this is when you've heard me say value chain early on in my States, this is value chain. This is the total value chain of it all. I'll, I'll just dive into a few things. When I think Bill mentioned supply chain. We look at supply chain for LNG. But supply chain, does not just for one fuel, but it's for all fuels. And what I mean by that is even if you have the perfect community that can right, make the right um, fuel that is zero carbon, but if, if that fuel is not in, in the area where you need it, you need to send it there. And then if you send it there, you need a place to be able to store it, to handle it, to make sure that you're still there. That's all part of the supply chain or the value chain for the, for the actual supply chain. When you look at regulatory support, right? There are, you know, there were there were certain regulatory factors that might um, might be prohibitive to you moving in one direction for one actual fuel source or another, right? There's, there's different things that kind of go along with that. So having that and making sure that those are working together with you. Um, when you look at the, the one, the other one I want to kind of harpen to is you also want to do this in, co- in, in coordination with what communities are actually looking for, right? How can you be coordinating with those communities to, so that they can understand what the long-term goal is, what you're going to do, and how they can be a part of that? Because I think that's the one thing that we've learned is that communities want to be a part of it. Communities want to know how they can be more, more proactive. So that's the value chain and what I'm, what I'm talking about from a total from the totality of how we can address uh, carbon um, through the entire value chain is looking at these external factors, right? There is a value chain with us with when you look at how it is employed on, on board a ship, but the, the, the externalities of that value chain is even greater. Thanks, Nick. And uh, some of the audience questions and, and there's for the panel, just to let you know, there's plenty of questions. Uh, we are a little bit limited on the time. But uh, let me take that the, the, the really the topic that has the most questions is uh, uh, Bill, you mentioned about LNG and, and Carnival on, on that side. So the questions uh, on LNG and, and, and when we talk about, uh, of course, this green corridor, there's each one of the regions has a little bit different fuel strategies and views on matters itself. So the question is um, related to uh, Carnival moving toward uh, using LNG. Um, there has been some discussions about the, 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 the long-term, uh, long-term longevity of the LNG as a fuel, um, whether it's a, uh, a transitional fuel, as well as the discussion about the methane slip itself. And uh, um, but Bill, you already mentioned some of the things related to supply chain, but do you want to comment on that one? Sure. I think the, uh, uh, you know, I think a lot of people talk about methane, or excuse me, um, LNG, as a uh, as a transitional fuel, and and I think in today's format it is a transitional fuel, but there is the potential for bio LNG or E LNG, which could become long term fuels. But as I mentioned earlier, we need the we need the green energy ashore, whether that's nuclear, um, solar, wind, geothermal hydrodynamic in order to produce that fuel in a green way. And once you do that, then we've taken a lot of carbon out of it. And, uh, and so I think it becomes a much more viable fuel in the, in the long run. Um, with regard to methane slip, it's, it's clearly an issue with, uh, with today's engines. It happens in, in different parts of the, of the supply chain. But in today's engines, the, the OEMs are working hard to, to make the uh, engines better to, to minimize that, that methane slip. Still, net-net, it's the, 
it's the best option we have today. It's, uh, it, it's, it's not a, a great deal better, but it is better than what we have. It reduces particulates, it reduces, there's no sulfur. So there's, there's lots of good things that, that come from using LNG, but we've got to get to green LNG. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Jessica, you want to comment? Yeah, we don't have any LNG ships, so I'm probably not the best one to comment, but I would say um, I kind of co sign what Bill said there, where, where it, it is one of the better solutions that's available today. And it goes back to what we discussed in the very beginning, where it's not going to be a solution, right? It's going to be solutions. So every single ship in the industry is not going to be able to run on the same fuel. We're going to need to have a mix of different options that progressively help us get to that, that um, larger goal here. Thanks. And Nick, any comments on, on your side? Yeah, no, just I just want you know, obviously what, what Bill said is, is we're in line and, and what we're doing there. And I, I think, as Jessica said, it's going to be solutions, not one, not two, but there's going to be multiple LNG, especially when you get to the ELNGs and, and, the, and the more of the bio LNGs and stuff like that, is where LNG really becomes the actual part of the solution, because no matter what fuel source comes out, the availability of that fuel source in masses is going to be an actual concern, whether it's a biodiesel, whether it's an ELNG, whether it's methanol, whether it's hydrogen, right? In order to support the, the overall landscape of those users, not just shipping, but users of those fuel cells is going to be a lot. So the more that we can use different types of fuels in order to actually achieve the same goal um, is always better. So, you know, taking this first step with LNG is, is definitely one of the moves that is something that we can do today as we continue to develop what those future fuels look like. Thank you for the panel. And yeah, it's the future proofing these uh, uh, ships and, and, and especially when, as Jessica, you say, it's like the longevity and, and the lifespan of the assets itself is quite a long time. And as well as it is the supply chain issues and certain things we have, technical issues have almost all resolved. It is, do we have a supply as, as uh, all of you mentioned about this, about it is going to be a mix of solutions. So uh, I thanks I thank you for the panel. Um, for the audience, there's a plenty of questions. Unfortunately, we really are running out of time over here. So um, we are moving to the next topic and, and we'll do our best to respond on those uh, questions that you have. Uh, so next topic. Um, is the port, uh, port uh, spotlight. So over here, the key theme we hope our audience to hear today is that decarbonization strategies will differ based on each port's conditions and resources. An urban board is well-resourced, will have, uh, that is well-resourced, will have a different decarbonization strategy than remote port in a small town. But the solutions have to align with a, uh, with a global industry that coordinates calls around the world. So um, I wanna invite, uh, invite now David Fuyumoto, Senior Environmental Program Manager for the, uh, uh, from the Port of Seattle to share some of the early actions uh, the Port of Seattle has taken to support industry decarbonization. David, floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Vesa. I appreciate it. Uh, let me um, get my uh, presentation up here on the screen. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad to be here today to uh, talk about some of the Port of Seattle's work in preparation for decarbonized operations and our deployment of clean energy to serve our port and maritime industry customers. Uh, as a little bit of background, the Port of Seattle is a special purpose government whose mission is to promote economic opportunities and quality of life in the region. We do this by advancing trade, travel, commerce, and job creation in an equitable, accountable, and environmentally responsible manner. Uh, the port owns and operates maritime aviation facilities in the Seattle metropolitan area, and along with the Northwest Seaport Alliance, which is our cargo operating partnership, the Port of Seattle supports over $41 billion in total economic activity in the region. Maritime operations include cargo terminals, three cruise berths, the home of the Pacific Northwest commercial fishing fleet, recreational boating, a grain terminal, and an extensive real estate portfolio. <clears throat> 
The Port of Seattle has established important greenhouse gas emission goals with targets to reach net zero for the port's own operations by 2040 and carbon neutral across all port and customer operations no later than 2050. The Port Commission established these goals to reduce risk from climate change, support the long-term success of our maritime industries, and eliminate the negative impacts of pollution on health of people and habitat. In planning our, for our clean energy future, one of the port's strategic advantages is the availability of clean power. Over 93% of the port, uh, the power coming to the port is emissions free, and our local utility, CLC Light, is a national leader in clean energy and became the first electric utility in the country to achieve zero net greenhouse gas emissions way back in 2005. In fact, the Pacific Northwest benefits greatly from abundant hydro, wind, and solar resources. In British Columbia, Canada, about 87% of electricity comes from hydropower sources. And as of 2022, in Washington, there were over 3,500 megawatts of wind and solar resources online or in development. And in the long run, the region will be among the first to support a decarbonized grid with Washington state targets for carbon neutral electricity by 2030 and emissions free power by 2045. Since 2009, the port has been home to the world's first two birth shore power facility, uh, <clears throat> something accomplished in partnership with our cruise line partners. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in 22, 2022, we connected 69 ship calls to shore power avoiding over 2000 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions. And we are currently working to electrify our third cruise, cruise ship berth in 2024. That project uses an innovative submarine cable to avoid disrupting downtown streets and businesses, traveling nearly one, million, one mile to a point of connection uh, to the south of downtown Seattle. That project will make the Seattle, Port of Seattle the, a fully electrified free berth cruise home port. And of course, electrification is not just a cruise strategy. We're in the process of commissioning a new shore power facility at Terminal 5, uh, a recently modernized international shipping terminal, and we are moving ahead with planning for additional cargo berths. Getting vessel plug-in capabilities at our, ter our terminals is an important initial step, but we're preparing for the carbon-free future, and we're just getting started. Oops, part, apologies, the little slide difficulty here. David, as you're working with technology, I'll ask the audience to submit questions for you. Sounds good, thank you. The Port of Seattle has established a long-term partnering agreement with Seattle City Light to help ensure we can tap into clean power when and where it is needed to support our maritime industry customers and partners. Electrification is a smart first step to decarbonization, taking advantage of the efficiency and low total cost of ownership of electric drivetrains. Together, we're developing a roadmap of enabling infrastructure to drive the maritime decarbonization across the port. Through this effort, which we call the Seattle Waterfront Clean Energy Strategy, we're looking over a longer term horizon and for forecasting power demands at our facilities, reviewing on terminal power infrastructure and identifying port and utility upgrade needs, timing and investment requirements. We're also evaluating energy storage technologies and other non wire solutions for some of our largest facilities that can reduce infrastructure costs, optimize grid resources, and improve reliability. The Seattle Waterfront Clean Energy Strategy brings together the port's ambitions as the greenest, most energy efficient port in North America, and it combines it with the nation's greenest utility to leverage Seattle City Light's clean power and prepare our facilities for rapid decarbonization. We look forward to working with our customers, community, and maritime industry as we move this strategy forward to completion later this year. Electrification is one piece of the picture, and we're looking at other options to replace liquid fossil fuels and meet the operational requirements of maritime industry equipment. CLC Light has brought in the leading research capabilities of two national labs, the Pacific Northwest National Lab and Sandia National Lab, to secure US Department of Energy grants to model dual purpose electrolytic hydrogen nodes to fuel heavy duty equipment and provide power to support the electrical distribution system in and around the port. And we're working with these same labs to provide a technical assessment of the risks and what's needed for safe storage of hydrogen in a port environment. 
Finally, we're excited about the potential of the Pacific Northwest Hydrogen Hub and the development of a regional ecosystem of hydrogen production, distribution, storage, and end uses. We believe green hydrogen will play an important role in the maritime industry to provide options for operation, improved operational flexibility, mitigating strains on power distribution systems, and as a key input into cleaner, renewable maritime fuels. We're eager to put these premises to work and to test these applications across the port. At the Port of Seattle, we're planning for a decarbonized future, and we aspire to be the place for your joint innovation projects and clean energy demonstrations. There are many ways we're partnering locally, and we welcome new opportunities. Together, we're driving collaboration, innovation, and leadership to power the clean energy transition. Uh, thank you very, very much for your time and attention, and we're happy to answer some questions. Thank you, David. And it's good to see Maritime Blue uh, join industry uh, projects over there. Uh, so uh, let me ask, uh, check out the question. So question to you, what is the fastest feasible connection and disconnection time for shore power? Uh, basically, at the moment, the, the one of, it, it adds on current 90 minutes of each end, uh, end leaves, uh, a lot of port, uh, port time not on shore power. Even when available, especially in, uh, for ports like Victoria, uh, where the calls might be as short as uh, four to six hours. So, yes, the feasibility and connection and disconnection of the show power. You want to comment on that? Oh, sure. Uh, I, I think that's a great question. I, I don't know that I know the exact exact answer to that. Um, we do know that um, with our connections in, in the port here. Um, you know, there there is a, a about an hour to I think an hour and a half on the front and the back side, and so trying to reduce that that time at birth where ships are not connected is is also part of the strategy. It's kind of an efficiency of, of uh, making those connections. Um, I don't think that we have the the solution for that just yet, but it's certainly something that's on our radar screen. Uh, we'd love to uh, collaborate with others to to find the best practices so we can improve our operations as possible there. Right, and another question is, what are the top barriers for ports right now on supporting uh, support, uh, supporting industry decarbonization? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. You know, I, I think, um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to do the, the planning work right now to get us prepared for the future. And part of that is uh, working closely with a, a whole host of, of parties uh, whether it's our, our customers and maritime industry partners who are, are developing new technologies and looking for places to deploy them, uh, working with the utility to make sure that we've got the power to support those industries when they're coming coming forward, and just understanding the timing uh, and likelihood uh, of those projects is, is very helpful. And so uh, we're, I think, fortunate to be in a position where we have a lot of good connections and we've started some of that planning work. Uh, the more information we can get about the potential projects, uh, and what things people are willing to and interested in exploring, the better we can match up those those kind of uh, resources. So um, I guess coming to us and helping, uh, uh, having us help them uh, with uh, how we can move some of these projects forward. Thanks, David. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. There's additional questions, but those, of course, we will uh, hope uh, address as we uh, do with other questions later on and uh, submit the availability for the audience to see the answers on that side. So. Thank you again. Uh, we moving to our next and the last panel of the day, not the least. So the, 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 the last panel of today explores what is happening around the world and how organizations not specifically involved in the operation can support decarbonization efforts. So let me welcome our panelists. Kevin Humphreys, Lloyd's Register, President and Marine Offshore. Antonis Mikhail, International Association of Ports and Harbors Technical Director, and Brian Salerno, Cruise Lines International Association Vice President for Maritime Policies. Okay. So, um, starting with the first question, and, and this is coming, Kevin, to your directions. Uh, global corridors really have multiplied after uh, last year, 2022. What is the uh, what is the global status of green corridors efforts today? 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Vesa. And uh, thanks uh, for the port uh, putting this together and a chance to speak, uh, particularly in my role as the chairman of the Green Corridor Workstream at Blue Sky Maritime Coalition. So what, what you're seeing over the last year is that green corridors are continuing to grow, largely following the definitions that were established at COP26 in November of 2021. Um, and the goal there uh, was to demonstrate um, vessels or other green corridors, low or, or, or no, no emission corridors in the next eight to 10 years, basically going from point A to, to point B. So we've seen some international work. Uh, Lloyds did some work on uh, the Silk Alliance in, in an Asian route, doing analysis and initial, uh, initial sort of what's the lay of land there. We've also seen uh, Shanghai to the West Coast. Um, but what I wanted to do is, at the very least, focus in on what I think impacts most of most of this audience in, in North America, which is Blue Sky Maritime Coalition's focus. So we're seeing uh, a high level of activity, not only in Pacific Northwest, which has been moving uh, very uh, quickly, uh, and it's, it's a very nice uh, picture to, to paint for everyone, but we're also seeing movement in the Gulf Coast, Lower Mississippi to Houston, um, a couple different things we're, we're, we're looking at both from the fuel side um, and, and I'll, I'll come to the second piece, which is the, the data side. We're also seeing a ramp up in activity in the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence, as you might imagine, it's a natural um, area to, to, to focus on solutions. Um, and actually two aspects with Blue Sky, one being the same aspect here in terms of owners and technologies, and then the second aspect, which overlays, which is which is regulatory, which I think we'll get into a little bit. Um, we also think we're going to see a natural growth of a green corridor um, around the South Florida cruise industry as they build out infrastructure. That infrastructure will be available for other areas, uh, including international uh, uh, distribution of fuels to the islands and and to, to Central and South America. So, so those are some of the areas with high activity and and what our philosophy is is we we work in these various work streams is we're really looking for that low hanging fruit of green corridors and i think this is a really important point that it's not always about fuels and say engine technologies although those are important but i think um I think uh, Jessica mentioned the, the longevity of these vessels that we're dealing with. I mean, I mean the engines are going to be around for a long time. Um, and so you need to look at other solutions and what we want to demonstrate and help collaborate with is, is quick wins. And one of the places to do that is data. Um, if you don't have good baselining of all the data that goes on in the broader logistic systems, not merely the, the vessel uh, proper or the waterway proper, but the, the trucking logistics, the train logistics, what is the data landscape there so that at least we know where we are? I, mean, I think we all understand the idea that to, in order to change something, you need to be able to measure and, and monitor it and see how you're doing. So we really see data as one of the drivers as well um, and how we set baselines and how we move forward in, in green corridors. So those are some of the things that are going on and I think um, uh, the uniqueness of the American market, particularly when you talk about the Mississippi River, it illustrates a lot of our issue with, with emissions is in the waterways, um, at least half, definitely uh, slightly over half. So um, uh, while the administration um, has done a lot of good work in bringing agencies together to talk about decarbonization, a lot of it is focused on international trade. Um, we're also focusing on waterways that are um, domestic trade as well, where we see a lot of emissions. So that's a little bit of the high level view of what's going on in, in green corridors. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, there's a lot of activities going on. Um, and bringing the, the other panelists over here, it's the uh, Antonis, I, I'll start with you and then follow up with Brian. Uh, what are the, what, what's, what are some of the regulatory or policy issues that need to be addressed to accelerate decarbonization? Thank you very much, uh, Vesa, for the questions and many thanks to the organizers for uh, having me over. It's a pleasure for me to, to join you from uh, Europe uh, this evening here and very good morning for you to you as well. So I will transfer a bit the debate to IMO. I mean, as IPH, we represent the voice of uh, global ports or world ports at the, the debate at the International Maritime Organization. And when it comes to what we need in terms of rules and regulation, I will first point out two things. I think we are in an urgent need for a revised IMO greenhouse gas strategy that would be setting an ambitious zero target for greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 as well as intermediate targets for 2030, 2040, that will be in line with current climate science and will keep us in track to the 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius pathway. 
Uh, and uh, we work as IPAs with all the parties that express their views in IMO, and we really uh, support such developments and we join forces with all those parties advocating this. And we, we need this development by MEPCAT coming July and IMO, we need them to deliver on that uh, pathway. At the same time, you know, setting a target, it's easy, the difficult uh, part is to move towards the target, of course. And for that, we also need that the level of, at uh, the global level, the level of IMO, a mix of concrete, mid and long-term measures, a mix of measures that apart from any technical standards and everything, we need to have an economic instrument, instrument or element, a market-based measure, if you like. I think it's time that uh, we need to put a, a price in carbon to bridge really the gap between conventional fuels and low and zero carbon fuels and make them more attractive and really ease and facilitate the energy transition at large. I think a big challenge towards um, the debate at IMO and moving even faster, as some of us would, would like to see at the, the global scale at the IMO level, is this whole polemic over how to ensure a just and equitable transition for all member states, for our IMO uh, member states. And we would also think as IPAs that you know, through a market-based measure that would generate some revenues and then through the actual attribution of those revenues in a way to kind of, you like, address the impacts, address the potentially negative impacts in various developing countries in also directing investments on the land side as well. I mean, we've heard before that the 85% of investments of the energy transition will happen in land. So a clever allocation of the revenues generated of such an economic uh, instrument, we argue that it also is energy transition, but also in a just and equitable manner. And I leave it to that for the time being and, and come back to that. Thank you, Bess. Thank you, Anton. And I would really appreciate you joining on the eve of the holiday, long weekend. So I think everybody else is already celebrating the, the long holiday over there. So thanks for joining in the evening in there. Um, continuing with Brian. Yeah, thanks, Vesa. Well, I, I agree with Antonis. I, I think the upcoming revision to the IMO strategy is probably the biggest blip on the radar uh, for the maritime industry in terms of greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, the, the current levels of ambition were set by IMO in 2018. And at the time, you know, they were pretty forward leaning. But I think we've all seen the world has moved beyond those. And that was especially the case coming uh, after uh, COP26, where, you know, you know, elements of the maritime industry started um, pressuring IMO to do more. Uh, there was the Clyde Bank Declaration, uh, a lot of forward movement and the creation of green corridors. Uh, and even now we're seeing in the lead up to the to the Marine Environmental Protection Committee, the, the 80th session that, that will occur in July, quite a few proposals put forward as to what, you know, a revised and upgraded levels of ambition might look like. Uh, so I think it's it's safe to assume it's going to be more stringent than it than is currently the case, uh, probably oriented around uh, the year 2050. And if you think about it, you know, the current strategy, you know, it has a number of elements, both from an intensity standpoint and a, an absolute carbon standpoint. But it had a you know decarbonization for the industry before the end of the century. Well, nobody is going to accept that anymore. I mean, I think we're looking at about a 50 year advancement forward you know, on that goal uh, to the, you know, roughly 2050 and some version of what zero means. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that plays out. I think there are other pressures on IMO as well. Uh, and that includes what's coming out of the EU, uh, the whole Fit for 55 package of initiatives, which includes, you know, a, a, a fuel standard emissions trading system. So it gets into that, that market-based measures that Antonis was talking about. Um, alternative fuel infrastructure requirements, which really um, stimulates the investment in shoreside electricity. All of that is, is occurring as well. And in many ways are ahead of IMO. So that puts pressure on IMO to at least catch up, if not do more. Um, I think from a, you know, other policy elements, uh, there were a few things that were mentioned earlier. I think Bill Burke mentioned a few about, you know, training and alternative fuels. I, I think the industry overall, um, as it begins to converge on the different types of alternative fuels, will really have to do quite a bit of work on, on setting standards. Uh, not only training standards, you know, for crew members, um, but also um, 
you know, you know, the, the safety standards, you know, how, how are we going to, what are the procedures that will be followed you know, with these alternative fuels? Uh, we've seen this play out with LNG, but, you know, with all the other alternative fuels that potentially could be used, uh, they raise, you know, different, different types of concerns. And, you know, ammonia, I think, is the one that uh, is the most concerning from its toxicity standpoint, whether we would use that in a cruise environment, I, I think is doubtful, but they all have their pros and cons and the people that handle them, you know, have to be familiar with them. So I think we'll see some combination of regulatory and standard setting bodies uh, that really weigh in on that, uh, including potentially in the SDCW convention. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, Brian. Uh, the next question for all panelists, um, how can an organizations that are not part of the first movers group support decarbonization? And uh, maybe I start, Antonis, I start with you. Yes, thank you, Visay. I think I will go again to point towards another IMO resolution, and I'm referring to the famous ports resolution in uh, that respect, which actually was, you know, kind of initiated by the government of Canada and IPH. That really sets the basis for a voluntary cooperation between ports and shipping when it comes to facilitating the decarbonization of shipping. And they have, they have been identified within that resolution four quite concrete areas. Shore power supply from renewable sources, as we've heard quite a lot today. Also, uh, the provision of port incentives to best performing vessels. And we have some splendid initiatives at the level of IAPH on that, the Environmental Ship Index, for instance. The, how we can ensure the safe and efficient bunkering of low and zero carbon fuel in ports. And our Clean Marine Fuels Working Group in IEPH is delivering some uh, great tools for ports to that respect, uh, starting with LNG 10 years ago, but really now producing the same tools, the safety tools on the bunkering side for hydrogen, for methanol, for ammonia, an important work. How we can as ports as well ensure and enable, if you like, the port call optimization, a just-in-time arrival of vessels and other areas as well of potential ports intervention. And all those are important areas. And uh, in IPH, let's say, well, green corridors, it was mentioned, it requires some background. It requires proactive industry, proactive ports, getting together already cooperation. And there are other things that can be done uh, as well, because we, we are very excited to see the concept and to see the spreading out of the concept of green corridors. But at the same time, at the level of IPH, we would hate to see that those corridors become purely, merely, if you like, signing exercises. And obviously, that's definitely not the case in the, in the, in the specific corridor. It's really pioneering things. But there are smaller steps that ports can take around the world to, to bring up to a level. Then obviously commit also to joint action with the industry to demonstrate actions such as in within green corridors. Uh, Brian, i let you follow. Yeah, uh, thanks, Vesa. Well, you know, I think whenever you start on a project like this, you, you have to um, do so in a limited way, you know, so that it becomes manageable. Um, but as, you know, we prove the concept in the future, I think there's room for um, other elements of the cruise experience to be brought in. For example, terminals. You know, we, we did not include terminals in, in this project right now. We did not include shore excursions and some of the, the land-based extensions of the, of the cruise experience. So. You know, in the future, uh, once, you know, if, assuming everything goes as envisioned and, and a card is established, I think there are uh, ways to bring others in uh, on this. And I think the even the larger question is, if a card is established in the Pacific Northwest, um, why limit it to cruise? Uh, if, if there are other users of the corridor, it would make sense from our perspective to, uh, to bring in other elements of maritime transportation into that corridor as well. So uh, I think uh, that's, that's future work, but uh, I think that's where I would see this going, uh, you know, as, as, we, uh, as we get more established. All right, and, and Kevin? Yeah, thanks, Vesa. I, I, my answer would be get involved in a collaborative organization like Blue Sky Maritime Coalition. Um, when, when, when Blue Sky was founded uh, back in June of, of 20, as you, as you remember, Vesa, our, our, our vision was and our thought was this problem won't be solved merely by owners and fuel suppliers or owners and engine manufacturers, for example. This was an industry collaborative effort. And so we, we've taken very special care to have folks from the uh, um, intellectual academic community um, doing basic research and, and studies, people from NGOs, port operators, 
new technologies, finance side. So all of those different aspects of the, the industry are available. And as successes are registered and as knowledge is gained, it can be shared there in a collaborative environment. So if I need to understand, for example, green finance, I have my technology down, I have my, my local collaborators down, but how do I finance this type of project? How do I, how do I trade carbon credits, for example? We have a finance work stream that you can get involved in and hear from experts and collaborate with experts in the industry across that entire ecosystem. Um, and I think that's what's going to make this move forward because these, these early wins and success cases will be identified and then shared um, through the industry. And I think as, as, as you heard Bill uh, Burke mentioned in the first session, um, that um, we have to work together. Even with competitors, we work together in a proper way to share information and, and move this forward. Thanks, Kevin. And I must say, it's like one of the things I've recognized as I go to the conferences and be part of the panels that the, the, the Blue Sky team is, is very active. I mean, you see uh, members throughout the different events and it's a great way of, as we, we, we discuss these matters is that, but also is that we align a lot of activities throughout the, both in, in, in Canada and the US. Um, so thanks for the panel. Uh, I have time at least for one question. So. Kevin, I continue with you, the question about, you mentioned about data. So the question comes uh, from Elizabeth Burton. Speaking of uh, good data, how will you measure the greenhouse gas emissions from the Green Corridor cruise ships along the whole route? Will the data methods be made public? Yeah, let, let me, I'll try to answer that just from a uh, step back a little bit from a, yeah. a technical standpoint. I think there's a couple ways to do it in, in terms of what, what fuel burn is. Um, there's there's some great new companies out there that are, that are uh, generating methods to make sure you have very, very accurate fuel burn information, either on the on the burn side or, or the exhaust side. Um, and so I, I, I'll answer from that standpoint. I don't want to speak for, for the port or the, the, uh, the first movers and how they're going to do that. But I, as someone heavily involved in the, in the startup and tech community in Maritime, I'm seeing a lot of great new solutions. Um, and, and those are going to be available to owners and operators and ports to measure and monitor. Um, I just think the key is getting data, lots of data, um, as your as your first uh, uh, point, um, that you can make decisions based on that data, and I think that's really the key f philosophically. Okay, um, Brian, any comments related to data and, and and availability of data from your point of view? Um, you know, I I think one of the things that uh, we hope to get from the feasibility assessment is I, I think are maybe some of the elements that would contribute to our data needs. Um, you know, I, I, there was certainly going to be quite a bit that's required um, in terms of data reporting under IMO, uh, the data, uh, the data system there, um, which would be, you know, available. But I think specific to, to this project, as we go forward with the feasibility study, we'll, I think we'll get a level of specificity that uh, will inform, you know, how we, how we measure the, the success of this project in the future. Thanks, Brian. Antonis, I give you the last word. Mm -hmm. Well, the only, well, one of the things that came to mind, it's not so much related to the route, but together with uh, with CLIA, actually, we work together on, on, on putting a new module as part of our environmental SIP index, a, a new module uh, dealing with adverse emissions and starting with cruise vessels over there. But as part of that cooperation, we expect a bit to have some good quality data for emissions of cruise vessels at birth and maybe we can see also how we can also talking about good data, then it's part of that exercise. And that's something that we're uh, actually involved now. I'll, I'll leave it to hear this. All right. Also, we have the time. Thank you. And now we are coming to the end of this. So thank you for our audience joining the discussion today and all the panelists providing this update. Um, one of the observations, is like as you can see from the, the, from the audience point of view, you see how much of the, the first movers group is is a is a significant member of stakeholders on this green corridor, and 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 also what I'm really excited about the, the engagement by the audience of the Q, uh, Q and A. So, sorry we didn't have that much time for the questions, but the questions were great and very detailed. And on my behalf, I uh, and behalf of Bertha, and then also from the Blue Sky point of view, coalition point of view, thank you very much for uh, joining spending an hour and a half of your day, uh, time of your day with us. 
Um, and for everybody, have a great day. Good evening. Good, uh, well, everybody else is in the afternoon side. Thank you very much. And uh, now we'll provide you details how to, uh, how to stay in touch. Thank you very much. Bye.